I really did not like this book. Hey everyone, this is another BookTube channel, and today I'm going to do my very best to not curse and scream as I review The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward. There are a lot of people that love this book, so I want to establish right off the bat, no hard feelings. If you like this book, that's fine. Media quality is subjective. What works for me isn't going to work for everyone else, and vice versa. I wish that I could have enjoyed this book right along with you. Instead, I read this book almost from page one with a mounting rage that only got worse as the story progressed. Let's get into it. I'll be keeping things as spoiler-free as possible for the first half of this video, but in the second half I will go into spoilers and I'll give you a warning ahead of time because it's impossible to discuss my complete thoughts without talking about the ending. The Last House on Needless Street is about Ted Bannerman, a reclusive drunk who's living alone in his childhood home. Eleven years prior, Ted was the suspect in the disappearance of Lulu, a little girl visiting a nearby beach with her parents. Lulu was never found, and nobody was ever charged with the crime. Now, Ted spends much of his days drinking with his only source of income pawning off stuff from his house piece by piece. Occasionally, Ted's daughter Lauren visits, and much of the book is about their relationship. One day, Dee, the sister of Lulu who never stopped looking for her, moves into the house across the street from Ted, as she is convinced that she's finally going to find the evidence to implicate him in her sister's disappearance. The story is told primarily through points of view of Ted, Dee, and Ted's cat, Olivia. Yes, his cat. Ooh, it just started raining really hard. Well, if you guys can hear that, enjoy the sound of rain. It is very, very difficult to talk about this book without giving anything away, so forgive me if this portion of the review is a bit vague. But when it comes to a mystery in general, you need to have a story that can't be figured out too early, but also doesn't feel like a cheat at the end. The worst kinds of mysteries are the ones that you couldn't solve because the author either provided you with misleading information, or they just omitted details entirely. After just the first 17 pages of the book, which is the first chapter, I leaned over to my wife and I said, Babe, I am really nervous that I already know what's going on in this book, and it stinks. And as the story unfolded, more details were added, but my initial hunch never wavered. I knew what was going on here, the only question that I had was, how far is Catriona Ward going to take it? Because I knew what was already going on, my reading experience here was infuriating. Every time Ward would drop another hint that just led to the conclusion that I had already reached, I just felt like screaming at the book. It's like watching a small child do a magic trick. They have no sleight of hand skills whatsoever, so you can see every move that they make. You can see them stack the deck. You can see them reach into their pocket to get the extra coin. But in their mind, they are pen and teller. Like, they are killing it. But this isn't a child's magic trick, so I'm not going to act surprised when Catriona Ward shows me the card that I saw her place at the very beginning. So, I knew the hook here early, but how far was the twist going to go? At around the halfway point, I went back to my wife and I said, Okay, here's the situation. Either this book does one thing, and then it's okay but predictable. Or, it does another thing, and I am going to be furious. Sure enough, it did the second thing. My ultimate issue with the big reveal is that it feels like it was only achievable by Ward lying to the reader for much of the book. Even though I predicted the outcome, it was in spite of the clues that Ward dropped in. Not because of them, if that makes sense. Like, I got the sense that I knew she was being misleading, so I specifically was like, I bet she's gonna be doing this instead, and it's not earned. I will say, credit where it's due, there are two big reveals at the end of this book, and I actually didn't see one of them coming, and I think on its own, it would have been a good enough twist for this book to work with just that. But I couldn't even enjoy that because I was in such a bad mood while reading every page that 
It made it so that even when the book did something good, I couldn't enjoy it. Some people say like, oh, you may have just found it confusing or maybe you didn't get it. No, it wasn't confusing. I got it completely. It just didn't work, in my opinion. Okay, so from here on, I'm going to be discussing spoilers, so skip to the timestamp here if you would just like to see my conclusion. So, the big reveal here is that Ted, his daughter Lauren, and his cat Olivia are all just Ted, and he has dissociative identity disorder. Now, I knew he had DID from the very first chapter. I'm not even sure it was actually meant to be a secret, like that's how obvious it was. So maybe I'm reading too much into it in terms of that being a twist. I just wasn't sure how far that twist was going to go. Like it could have been that Lauren was another personality of Ted's and the cat was real and unsure of what to make of it because it's a cat. It could have been that Ted and the cat were one person. It also could have been that the cat and Lauren were both real and they were both just little girls that Ted had kidnapped. Because honestly, I never actually believed that the cat was a cat for one second. But the reality of all three being one person was the worst thing that I could have imagined because it just screamed laziness to me. Since I had this hunch from the start, every single chapter I read from the point of view of Ted or one of his alters was frustrating as it wasn't fooling me and it wasn't giving me any new revelations. I already knew what was happening so I just wanted it to be over. The twist in which it's revealed that Dee was responsible for Lulu's death the entire time was a pretty good one, and I didn't see it coming entirely because I was so focused on being mad at the DID plot. That being said, I still wasn't completely satisfied with this reveal, as the backstory we were given up front just turns out to be completely falsified. There weren't any actual clues for us to follow there, Dee was just an unreliable narrator due to her own mental illness, so as a reader, we didn't stand a chance. In a mystery novel, the reader is completely at the mercy of the author to be treated fairly and to be given a real shot at maybe figuring out what's going on, and I never really feel like I got that here. Quick cut in while I'm editing this, I'm not saying that every mystery book should be easy enough for the reader to figure out at the end. I mean. There's a reason that Sherlock Holmes is smarter than us. It's because he has the same clues and he comes to better conclusions. But that's different than the author telling us one story, saying like, these are the clues, and then at the end being like, just kidding, it has nothing to do with that. The Last House on Needless Street is tedious and nowhere near as original as it thinks. It failed to form a connection between me and the characters, so all I was left with was a mystery that I solved in the first chapter. I love an unreliable narrator when it's done right, and this book manages to do it wrong at least four times. I really, really did not like this book, and my arbitrary and subjective grade for it is 2 out of 10. Do with that what you will. If you've read The Last House on Needless Street, leave a comment below telling me your thoughts. Thank you for spending some time with me today, but now it's time to get back to reading.